Friends, welcome. We're going to get started now. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today uh, in the auditorium here at the Community Church of Boston. Thank you, everyone who's watching from home, from across the state and across the country and from around the world. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, for joining us today. We're here live at the Community Church of Boston. This church has been in existence for over 100 years. In the last 100 years, uh, we've done lots of events and different things. We get together, we read books, we have discussions, debates, we challenge ourselves on the most important issues of the day, and that's what we're engaging in tonight. Uh, over the last hundred years, we've had many remarkable speakers. Some of them have included people such as Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., W.E.B. Du Bois, and General Smedley Butler, just to name a few. So tonight, uh, for the format of tonight's event, we are going to hear a talk from our guest speaker, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson. He's going to deliver us a talk about the most important issue of our day today, the genocide in Gaza, the Holocaust that's happening in Gaza, being executed by Israel, being funded and supported by the United States. After Colonel Wilkerson's talk, we'll, I'll give a short announcement. And after my announcement, we'll hear music from our music director and church administrator, Dean Stevens. And after Dean's music, we'll hear a statement from the Community Church of Boston. And then after that, all of that, my announcement, the music, and the statement will take about 10, 15 minutes. After that, we'll have a question and answer portion uh, to wrap up for the evening. So our guest tonight, uh, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, traveled a long distance and made time in his busy schedule to come speak with us about Gaza and about Israel and the Middle East and Iran and China and Taiwan and the war in Ukraine. And he's here with us tonight. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson is a retired colonel of the United States Army, where he served for over 31 years. After he retired from the Army, he also had an extensive, uh, impressive, significant career in the government, where he held many positions, including special assistant to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and perhaps what he's best known for as Chief of Staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell, who was his friend and mentor. Uh, Colonel Wilkerson also taught at the College of William and Mary and at George Washington University. So it's my honor to welcome Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson. The old man sits down. <laughs> well, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction and thank you all for coming out and thank you for having me here. Um, when MR sent me the uh, email and listed in there W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And I looked up some others that you've had. Uh, I was very flattered, to be very honest with you, to be invited up here. Um, Boston is a favorite city of mine used to come up here quite often when I was a student at the Naval War College and then later when I was a professor there because you have good theater and good food. <laughs> Gaza and Ukraine are stealing, eating up, evaporating, choose your verb, all the oxygen in the air in Washington right now, as well they should be but for not the reasons that they are, in my view. Let me give you just a little bit of, of what I call my snapshot of history to kind of put this into some perspective for you, for me. I'm not going to try to rehearse everything, but I'm going to try to give you what I think is a historical background, a background that I used to use with my students at both universities and elsewhere, in order to frame it for them so they could understand the evolution. Because a lot of my students were 19, 20 years old. They didn't even know who Colin Powell was. Some of them weren't even born when 9-11 occurred or were, you know, little infants. 
So I said, quick brush, 1798, George Washington, beginning of the Republic, if you will. Four empires in the world. The British, the preeminent one in many respects, from whom we'd broken away, the Spanish, the French, and the Russian. Russian, yeah. They were messing around out in California and Idaho, what, what is California and Idaho today. So we had four empires in the world. So we had to mind our business, and we did. We were very circumspect about our business. We didn't send our military abroad to fight anybody because we'd get slaughtered if we did. So we were just intent on what historians have come to call manifest destiny, which is a terrible term. What we were doing, in essence, was ethnically cleansing the entire continent so we could have it all for ourselves principally against Native Americans and from time to time using some black Americans to help. Most Americans have no idea that blacks have served in the United States Army since its inception. There were 5,000 with General Washington, for example, and he only had about 27,000 effectives at any given time. And they served in every other conflict that we've ever been involved in including the ethnic cleansing out west with the buffalo soldiers to aid it. So we went right on till we got to about 1860, and then we had a big, big war. The empires got interested in us when we did that. They sent battlefield observers to almost every major battle, Antietam, Gettysburg, Cole Harbor. At the end of that war, we had a million-plus Men, it was all men then, under arms. The world, including the empires, were shivering because their consuls and their observers on those battlefields had sent word back. And the word was, be careful, watch out, because this military will be used. If you have this kind of battle-hardened, battle-ready military, it will be used. They were wrong. We disassembled that military in a matter of months. We sent it out, what was left, to finish the ethnic cleansing in the so-called Indian Wars from 18, 1866 to 1890. Then we just kind of tripped along, fat and happy. Grant made, made it into the presidency for two terms. We made treaty after treaty with those ethnic Americans, not a single one we ever kept. That is a factual statement. We have never kept one of our treaties, and there were many, with Native Americans. And then we got to Teddy Roosevelt, and Teddy started feeling his muscles a little bit. Remember, I said this is a real quick hash of our history, leaving a lot out. Great white fleet went around the world. The empires trembled again because it looked like there might be something aborning there. And by the way, by 1890, we had replaced the British in terms of the number one economic power in the world. What did we do? Well, we crept up on World War I. We had a racist named Woodrow Wilson in the presidency, and we crept into that war, and we made a bejesus fortune off of that war. We made so much money off the disputants on all sides that it was incredible. And then finally, we couldn't keep ourselves out of it. We wanted to make the world free for democracy. And so we got involved in that one. And we came home pretty soon after that. We weren't there really that long, if you think about it. And we really weren't in the battle that long. But we probably did make the decisive difference that made one of the world's worst conflagrations suddenly seem like just that terrible thing to be doing. France and Britain lost the flower of their manhood. Germany lost the flower of its manhood, but not to the extent that it couldn't come back because we made such a mess of the peace. And so we came back again. And again, we were reluctant until the Japanese hit us at Pearl Harbor. And that gave Roosevelt an opportunity to do what he had wanted to do for some time and was already doing. We'd been at war in the North Atlantic, for example, for a year before Pearl Harbor got hit. And we got into that one as the arsenal of democracy, and by Lord, we were. We supplied the Soviets 
840,000 wheel vehicles we gave the Soviets. I used to show my students a picture of the Russian regimental commander coming into Berlin in 1945. And I had this capability to zoom in on the Jeep. I said, look, what kind of Jeep is that? It's a Ford Motor Company Jeep. We supplied the Free French. We supplied the British. We supplied ourselves. We were the arsenal of democracy. The Soviets beat the Wehrmacht, the finest military in the world at the operational level. They beat it all the way from Stalingrad all the way to Berlin. They beat the Germans. Normandy was an aftermath. Normandy was a waltz into France and up to the Rhine. 78,000 casualties in the Battle of the Bulge because we took our eye off the ball, but still, the Soviets had really taken the fire out of the Wehrmacht. But at the end of that war, what were we? We were the new Rome. No question about it. 51% of the world's GDP. We made 50,000 airplanes in a single year. We couldn't make 200 in a single year now. The Army had 7,000 ships. The Navy had 13,000 ships. We left whole regiments of equipment in Tokyo Bay. Fish now make their nest around those reefs that we made in Tokyo Bay. We were the new Rome. Aha. But there was a Persia. You know anything about world history? There was a Persia. So we might have been the new Rome. We might have even been the Eastern Empire in Constantinople and the Western Empire in Rome itself together. But Persia was still fairly powerful. Persia, of course, was the Soviet Union. And the power equation was complicated majorly and existentially badly by the possession of nuclear weapons, which went to 60,000 warheads when the Cold War came to an end. Then we didn't have anyone. Then we went crazy, absolutely insane. And we have been insane ever since. Just tick them off. Your country has been in so many wars, killed so many people, destroyed so many societies, all in the name of freedom and democracy out of most president's lips that it makes you sick if you sit down and count them up and you listen to the hypocrites who talk about them in positive terms. Even Afghanistan, which I think I could make a case for, we didn't at the time. We said, we being Colin Powell and the State Department and others, you should keep on using law enforcement to fight terror. Law enforcement is what we use to fight terror. We shouldn't use the military instrument. But we understood when we were overruled because blood was in George W. Bush's mind. He called some Christians into his office and actually had them convince him not to be too much on a rampage. He even said this to us. He said, I had to get them in there, Billy Graham and all that bunch. I had to get them in there, and I had to sit around in the Oval Office with them, Franklin Graham. And I had to get them to calm me down because I was in a rage. I was in a rage. One thing Bush was, was a true born again Christian. And don't ask me questions about that. So here we are, maybe justified. Kofi Annan at this UN even said, okay. Didn't about Iraq later, but he did about Afghanistan. And what did we do? The one justifiable thing, perhaps, that we did, we just murdered. It stayed there 20 years until we didn't even know what we were doing there and then pulled out ignomini ignominiously. And the military paid the president for ordering it back. The military screwed up the withdrawal, in other words. But in the interim, we went to war, and Kofi didn't approve this one. He said it was an illegal war, and he was absolutely right. 
Read the UN Charter. It was absolute. He was absolutely right. He did not. The UN Security Council did not give us their blessing to go to war in Iraq, but we went anyway. Killed tens of thousands of people. Drove millions into internal or external diaspora. Ruined the Levant for twenty years. It still hasn't recovered. You ask any Iraqi today on the street of Baghdad if he was better off under Saddam Hussein or now, and he'll say Saddam Hussein for sure. And, oh, that wasn't all. We tried to knock out Bashar al-Assad. We recognized him as a legitimate leader of Syria, however despicable he might have been. We tried to knock him out. We failed. And Syria is a basket case now. And, oh, oh, Hillary took us into Libya. And we messed that country up and got Muammar Gaddafi murdered. And she said the most impolitic diplomatic remark an American secretary of state has ever made. And, boy, that's a list. We came, we saw, and he died. I wanted to smack her. I wanted to smack her in the face, just like I wanted to smack John Kirby every day when he gets up there and says things. Kirby getting up there and saying what he said about the South African application to the international court. A diplomat would have said, well, in response to the reporter's question, well, South Africa is a sovereign country. South Africa has every right to make an application to the court. South Africa is in the panoply of nations recognized by the United Nations. No, he gets up there and uses three despicable adjectives to describe the South Africans, not even thinking that in most people's eyes, especially Americans, South Africa is a black state. And he's a white man up there saying this. These people are crazy. They're insane. They have no diplomatic skill whatsoever. They have no common humanity whatsoever. They're despicable, unconscionable people. Now, that's the short history. Where are we today? We are mired in two conflicts that are absolutely, unbelievably insane. One is Ukraine, and the other is Gaza. They are very different conflicts. One is in the heart of Europe. One is in the heart of the Levant, if you will, with our erstwhile ally, Israel. But they have some characteristics that are similar. The first one is they are both insane. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever what we're doing in either place. And let me start with Ukraine for just a minute or two. Back to that sketch I gave you, but not very far, back to the end of the Cold War. I was there with my boss. He was there with Ronald Reagan when he was National Security Advisor to Ronald Reagan, his last one, and then the deputy before that. So two years with Reagan. And those two years were also with H.W. Bush, who was then the vice president for eight years for Ronald Reagan. He was there in St. Catherine's Palace with Gorbachev. He was there on Long Island with H.W. Bush, Reagan, and Gorbachev. He was there with Shevardnadze when they did this. Shevardnadze was the foreign minister of the Soviet Union slash Russia at that time. Really Mikhail Gorbachev's right-hand man. We were all there when we said, in essence, hey, this is a really special moment. And Gorbachev was a special creature in that moment. We are going to take advantage of this. And Bush said, we are not going to beat our chest. That was his exact words. We are not going to beat our chest. We're not going to trumpet our victory. We're not going to step on them with track shoes. We're going to establish some sort of regime, he called it the new world order, in the world, that will live up to the very standards we put in the UN Charter. That's what we're going to try to do. And Helmut Kohl, Chancellor of Germany, a brilliant man, Francois Mitterrand in France, Maggie Thatcher and John Major in England, and others, were on the phone every day trying to discuss what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. When Helmut Kohl was told that maybe he could reunify Germany, he was stunned. He didn't know whether he wanted to. Smart man. 
first of all, it was going to cost, by their own estimates, 80 billion U.S. It wound up costing about 200 billion U.S. <laughs> but that was the projection at that time, and that was really formidable from Bond's perspective, West Germany's perspective. Then when he was told that Gorbachev would probably let him stay in NATO if he reunified, he was thunderstruck. He couldn't believe it. And initially, he was against it. Why? Because he knew that Moscow's vibes would be a little negative, no matter what Gorbachev said. He has to live with that 11-time zone country. And so he was a little bit concerned. He wanted to do it. He wanted to be the chancellor who reunified Germany, and he wanted to stay in NATO, but really uneasy about it. H.W. Bush took care of that unease, and so did Mikhail Gorbachev. And Francois Mitterrand came right along, too. One of the reasons was because both Jim Baker, H.W.'s Secretary of State, and H.W. himself told Gorbachev, if all of this comes to pass, NATO will not move one inch further east. Now, today, Bill Clinton and a host of other neophyte asses have essentially said that was just a spoken word, and that's not sealing. You know, gentlemen's words are not treaties. That's right out of Bill Clinton's mouth, as a matter of fact. Well, I'm sorry. That's not the world I grew up in. The world I grew up in is your word is your bond, whether you're a diplomat, a president, or whatever. Well, so we just violated that, and we've been violating it ever since. Anatoly Chubai and Larry Summers, you've heard that name before, I'm sure, raped, pillaged, and plundered Moscow with fire sales of all the old Soviet Union hard assets to the oligarchs. And the fees they gained off of that, Increased, for example, Harvard's endowment by about $19.6 billion overnight. Was Larry Summers really fired because he made some impolitic remarks about women in science? Or was he fired because Harvard figured out where the money came from? Didn't give it back, of course. Russia, in other words, has no reason to believe or respect or to have anything to do with Washington. And Putin tried, and I have no love for Vladimir Putin, but he tried time and time again to prevent having to use troops in Ukraine. He even gave us a dramatic example. My president, George W. Bush, Neil Fight par excellence, went to Tbilisi, and standing beside that young president, Saakashvili, who is now mayor of Odessa, show you how Georgians get around, stood right there beside him in the public square and said Georgia would be a member of NATO in the future. What did Putin do? He invaded, took the two northwestern uh, oblasts for all practical purposes, still some Russian troops there, what would we think he'd do with Ukraine? Much, much, much more strategic. Of course he's going to invade. But this time he decided, I think, he was going to teach us a little bit of a lesson. And he really didn't invade to take Kiev. He didn't invade to do anything but to teach those Johnny-come-latelys in Kiev who were being back to the hilt by us and had been since 2002. I was there, remember? Didn't leave the State Department until 2005. I was there with Tymoshenko and Yatoshenko and all those criminals because that's what they were. Yulia Tymoshenko was even that. We had been fomenting the situation in Ukraine since at least 2002 and big time since 2006 and 7, when the European commander, four-star Air Force General Philip Breedlove, used to get on his Harley, yes, and ride down the Autobahns and on down into Ukraine and talk with the Azov Battalion and others like that. 
we have been in Ukraine fomenting all manner of unrest to get at Russia. Weak, very weak. We can take them on. We can take them on. So all the neoconservatives came out of the woodwork. Okay, let's finish Russia off before we do China. And Ukraine was the way we were going to do it. Wrong, people. Wrong. You misjudge, misestimated <laughs> George W. Bush. <laughs> Russia. Yeah, Russia lost in 1917. Had a lot of other things going on, though, in World War I. Oh, yeah, well, Russia's been beaten before, you know, blah, blah, blah. I've heard all the arguments. Eleven time zones. You don't go to war with a country of 150 million people of 11 time zones, the strategic depth like no other country in the world, with roughly 38 million in Ukraine. You just don't do it. Even if you've got NATO behind you, you don't have anything but their arms behind you and their money. That's not going to beat the Russians. So now we're in a mess, complete mess. They have lost. They have lost so badly. If you're familiar with von Clausewitz and his von Krieg on war, you understand that war has its own dynamic, and every day that dynamic changes. Well, right now, the Russian military and Putin are looking at the dynamic favoring them, which says, why stop now? They didn't want all of Ukraine. What would he want with all of Ukraine? He'd have a guerrilla war on his hands. For If you've not looked at Napoleon and how the Ukrainian partisans fell on him, or you haven't looked at the Nazis, or for that matter, the Russians themselves, whom the Ukrainian partisans fell on, they didn't give a hoot who you were, communist, Marxist, capitalist, or whatever, they're bloody-minded people. They would fall on you and kill you and take your gold teeth. And that's what we're talking about. That's really what we're talking about. It hasn't changed a whole lot. He didn't want that. All he wanted was a little bit of control over those portions of Ukraine where dominant Russian populations existed and were being treated very terribly. And he was right. They were. As Ukraine's leadership changed, the pendulum swung one, one way and the other. But a lot of that pendulum was being pushed by us and by the British. Oh, don't let me forget perfidious Albion. I don't even recognize London anymore. I don't even recognize the British people anymore. Um, they're right in there, in for a penny, in for a pound. I'm going to put some troops and so, oh, do you know your military is about as big as a battalion of the American military? The British military is so small, you could put it in Ukraine, it'd be subsumed in 15 minutes. So where are we there? We're, we're at a point where they have lost and we're killing people still, even though they've lost. And we have a leader in Zelensky who's courageous, valorous, brave, use all the adjectives you want to, but hasn't a clue how to get out of this. <clears throat> so he's got to go. Got to have somebody in there who's interested in the future of Ukraine. And he's got to have somebody in Washington that backs that. Won't happen until the election's over. Because Joe Biden has been told by his advisors, and I think Joe himself thinks, and I've known him for a long time, that he can't get reelected if he's seen as cutting and running. So he's going to do an LBJ. LBJ knew that George Ball was right. He knew that he couldn't win in Vietnam. Quote from L LBJ, a quote, a direct quote, oh, ho, ain't going to be moved by no bombs. This is when he's being told by the Air Force that he should kill two and a half million Vietnamese with more iron bombs than we dropped in World War II on Germany. Why? And 30,000 more names on that big black marble wall down in Washington. Why? Because I don't want to be seen as cutting and running. Prestige, what Dean Acheson called the shadow of power. Prestige. A lot of things wrapped up in that word with Joe Biden and Ukraine, too. Don't want to be proved so blatantly wrong. That's where we are in Ukraine. Gaza, another matter altogether. We are paying for our fidelity to a people 
85% of the Israeli people who are Jewish are for this war. They don't necessarily like Netanyahu, but they are for what he's doing. We are lashed up to them in a way that is so debilitating, so against our national security interests, so against our humanitarian and reputational interests, that it makes your heart hurt to be in Washington and see it happening every day. And when Schumer gets up and makes a political statement, and that's what it was, pure politics, he sees all those people going away from the ballot box, and so he's got to make some overture in order to try and get them back. Does he really mean what he's saying? No, he's probably just like Mitch McConnell if you scratched him hard. It's unconscionable what I'm seeing happening in Washington. And every time somebody excoriates me or comes after me in some way for my appearances on television or whatever, I get a even more visceral view of these poisonous people who think first, too many of them think Israel's doing the right thing. One said to me, a patent neoconservative, if they weren't killing them, we'd have to be there killing them. And I asked him, explain yourself. What the hell do you mean? They're all terrorists. Those women and children at the foot of that hospital, that 2,000-pound bomb dropped on that you made and sent to them, they're terrorists? Well, they're supporting terrorists. They will. They'll grow up and be terrorists. It reminded me of what one person told me, a Serb who was a sniper in Sarajevo, and he just shot a 13-year-old boy on the street, and he was asked by a UN, before, uh, UN uh, peacekeeping force officer why he did that. And he said, because he'll grow up to be a terrorist. Well, that's what these people think. That's what these people think, and that's what Netanyahu thinks. And let me tell you another thing about Netanyahu and what he's been doing since he was finance minister. Netanyahu, first of all, running for office, created the turmoil and the anger that got Yitzhak Rabin assassinated. And then the settler who assassinated him, he resurrected him and made him a hero. This is Bibi Netanyahu. This isn't something new, what he's doing. He's been doing this for over 15 years, personally orchestrating it. Now, he's in and out of the political realm in different niches because he has to keep getting elected, otherwise he'd go to jail. But he's been doing this, what has now come to fruition in Gaza, for longer than 15 years. Slowly but surely, he's been exterminating the Palestinians in the West Bank. If you've been there, you know that it now has roads running through it. Some of them look like Audubons. And they're all to connect Israeli settlements and to screen out Palestinians. Ben Gavir has brought a new vengeance to this. Ben Gavir, his director of security, is handing out weapons now. AR-15 type weapons now for the settlers because what is their intent now that they've almost finished the West Bank and they've started on and will finish East Jerusalem fairly swiftly, their intent is to go into Gaza and to do it in Gaza. You may have seen the protests that occurred around the food, I wouldn't call them protests, the turmoil that occurred around the uh, food trucks not too long ago, about a week ago or so, and they killed a couple of hundred people. Well, part of that was because they got the settlers in there, too. The settlers are getting ready to do the things they did in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem, but now in Gaza. Rafa and what he's going to do there is probably the final act in terms of extermination, just outright extermination, and evacuation. He's going to have some left. So my query the other day of one of the guys who's been talking about this with me is he's on the ground in, in Gaza. What do you think is going to happen to the, the ones that are left alive? Well, they're going to go somewhere, and it isn't going to be staying in Gaza. Well, Egypt has said they won't take them. Jordan has said they won't take them. You can't push anymore into other places. You can't push them into the Sinai. What? What is going to happen? 
Well, he'll cross that bridge when he comes to it. I said, man, I've heard that before. Where'd you hear that before? When Will Taft, Powell's lawyer, asked Rumsfeld, Will said, essentially, you got a 13-year-old down there in Guantanamo, a 13-year-old. Let's say he lives to be 80. Are you prepared to see him stay there for almost another 70 years? And Rumsfeld looked at him and said, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Well, Rumsfeld's dead. We've crossed that bridge, and we still have people in Guantanamo. Bibi wants to get through this, stay out of jail, and turn it over to the next guy, who will do the same damn thing because they've been doing it since 1967. Palestinians would probably say they've been doing it since the Nakba. But they've definitely been doing it in contravention of international law, in contravention of what we say we stand for since 1967. And here's another thing. I became an Amaki Kurai on a court case that hinges around the courts, and we're contesting this decision by the courts, the courts at the federal district level having decided that Gaza is a foreign policy issue, and so the courts have no jurisdiction. And one of the things they're claiming is that Israel's actions on October the 7th were self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter. Here's my argument back to them. Israel has been under the UN Charter as an occupying power and under Geneva since 1967. It has never, never fulfilled its responsibilities as an occupying power, never intended to fulfill them. In fact, it has dispossessed the Palestinians of their lands, of their orchards, destroyed their homes, kill their children it is an irresponsible under the law occupying power therefore the palestinians had every right to do what they did on october the 7th that is not very comfortable in washington to make that kind of statement especially not amongst jewish americans or people who are tightly tied to israel but it is the facts and I can't wait to see what the judge says when he reads this case, if we get it to go forward. But that's how entrenched we are in it, because we are, as Gideon Levy from Haaretz has said so many times, every time that F-16 flies over Gaza and drops that 250-pound bomb and kills that child, you are guilty, America. You are as guilty as Bibi as anybody in that right-wing Likud administration, you are just as guilty because you are enabling it. They could not do it without you. They are drawing on our largest war reserve stockpile in the world, which is in Israel. Not only that, and they're getting extra munitions from all over the place. In fact, we're running so low now on certain key munitions that you've got the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and other service chiefs weighing in with the White House. You've got to stop this. Between Ukraine and Israel, we are becoming toolless, ammunitionless, etc. So the military is even weighing into it now. That's beside the point. These wars, Ukraine and Gaza, are at the top of the list of 20 years of stupid insane wars. Thanks. Do I resume my seat? <laughs> Thank you, Colonel Wilkerson, for that powerful talk. So next, uh, I'll make a brief announcement, and then we'll hear some music, and then we'll hear a statement from the community church. Uh, when President John Kennedy, President John Kennedy was killed on November 22nd of 1963. A few months before that, on June 10th of 1963, he gave a speech at Amer American University. In his speech, he gave 
a step-by-step -step plan on how to achieve world peace, his vision on how we could achieve world peace. And uh, then he did step one and step two of that plan before he was assassinated, which was a tragic day of history. Um, I'm part of a group which is led by Marty Schatz, who we feel like that the message that John Kennedy was delivering in that speech, it's timeless, it applies in any time or any era. The, the principles of that, principles such as looking at the situation from, your, from the other person's perspective in that speech to the American public, which was only a few months after the Cuban Missile Crisis, after the height of the Cold War, he praised Russia. He, he said he praised Russia for their history and their science and their literature and their sacrifice in World War II. So Marty Schatz and I and our JFK Peace Group, we feel like that that message is timeless and it transcends time and space. So every month we hold a screening of that speech and we invite a different person to comment on that speech. So uh, the reason I share this is because on April 10th coming up, Dennis Kucinich will be joining us and he will be commenting on John Kennedy's speech. That's on April 10th. On um, January, February, March, April, May 10th, on May 10th, a woman named Susan, I'm sorry, I forget her last name, but she's president of Veterans for Peace. She, was, she will be joining us, the president of Veterans for Peace. She'll be commenting on that speech. On June 10th, which is this year is the 61st anniversary of John Kennedy's speech. Last year, on June 10th, 2023, the 60th anniversary of John Kennedy's speech, Jeffrey Sachs commented on his speech. And Jeffrey Sachs is maybe the world's leading expert on that speech. He wrote a, he wrote a book about that speech. So he gave us a talk about it on June 10th, 2023. It has 100,000 views on our, on our YouTube channel. He'll be joining us again this year, again this year on the 61st anniversary of the speech to again comment on the speech. Last year he talked about, the title of his talk was <coughs> How We Can Learn from the Example of John Kennedy to Make Peace with Russia. Uh, so he'll be commenting on the speech again this year. And then uh, last but not least, on July 4th, the 4th of July, America's birthday, Independence Day, we will have Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson joining us again to uh, talk about President John Kennedy's speech. So that's my big announcement. Mark your calendars. April 10th, Dennis Kucinich. May 10th, the President of Veterans for Peace. June 10th, Professor, the world-renowned Professor Jeffrey Sachs. And 4th of July, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson. So join us, mark your calendars. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up, we're going to hear some music from our church administrator and music director, Dean Stevens. Everyone, let's welcome Dean. I just had to, uh, while I was listening to Larry, pick this book out from our library. General Smedley Butler, War is a Racket. And you know why I picked it out? Because, because Larry is, is a Smedley Butler for our time. Smedley Butler spoke here in 1935, passed on in 1940. And um, I just started reading it. And I got to read just a little bit before I go on. War is a racket. It has always been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. Could read the whole thing to you, but I won't. Um, before, no, I'm just gonna sing this song. He also survived the criminal law of two continents. The code, he only had a couple of states. <laughs> Say that once more and I'll, and I'll announce it. He said, I've been a criminal on two continents. I beat Al Capone and he only had two states. Love it. We had uh, Jonathan Katz uh, speak who wrote a biography of Smedley Butler. You can find it on our YouTube channel. Man of anger, man of war, my 
heart is filled with love Tell me what you are fighting for My heart is filled with love This death I see won't make me numb My heart is filled with love Every boy a mother's son my heart is filled with love Raise your voices, spread the news My heart is filled with love Buddhist, Christian, Muslim, Jew My heart is filled with love They all teach the golden rule My heart is filled with love to others as you've had them do. My heart is filled with love. I will not fear these foreign tongues. My heart is filled with love. There is a place for everyone. My heart is filled with love. I cannot make their will my own. Is filled with love. Fear can turn a heart to stone. My heart is filled with love. I do not know my neighbor's name. My heart is filled with love. I love that stranger just the same. Rising from this place, my heart is filled with love, divine wisdom, amazing grace. My heart is filled with love. Men of anger, men of war, my heart is filled with love. Tell me what you are fighting for. My heart. You must not miss Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, Mazen Kumsia, who joins us from Bethlehem. Um, he's been with us several times uh, physically as well as virtually. The last time it was 7 p.m. here and 3 in the morning there. Um, and he said, no problem. I'll, uh, he was supposed to be here uh, um, physically, but um, visa problems uh, didn't allow it. But he, he got up at 3 in the morning with, with his wife, Jessie. He'll be here, his, his talk is called Live from Bethlehem, a Bedouin in cyberspace, a villager at home. He is the director of the Palestine Museum of Natural History. The week after that, March 24th, Professor Gerald Horn on the genocide of Gaza, U.S. foreign policies and domestic U.S. politics. He joins us from Texas. And, um, and the week after that, Audrey Shulman from the group Heat, which uh, is doing just marvelous yeoman's work uh, bringing microgrids of geothermal energy to the streets of, of Boston. Um, we have all kinds of musical and comedy and, uh, and choral events. We have coming up very excited about David Rovics, March 29th, Friday. His tour is called Notes from a Holocaust. And he's the most prolific, most um, uh, hard-hitting, driving political uh, songwriter you've ever heard. We drop everything every time he's anywhere near here to, to host David Rovix. That same weekend, we also have um, uh, on April 1st, Monday, April 1st, is, is our, our great um, high holiday at Community Church, April Fool's Day. <laughs> and uh, we, will, we will host Jimmy Tingle. And it's a benefit for Community Church uh, during our hour of need. We have uh, a vacant restaurant space on the first floor. And um, we're very excited to host uh, Jimmy. He, he's a new friend of ours, and he's doing this 
at no, uh, for no fee. He's a legendary Boston comedian. We have um, several other concerts in April and in May, uh, choral concerts, uh, folk music concerts, classical concerts, jazz. Um, so join us. And um, I would like to now invite our clerk of, of our board of, board of directors uh, from Community Church. And while he's coming, I will invite you to yet another event, which is in the afternoon of March 24th, which is the uh, anniversary of the assassination of Monsignor Romero in El Salvador. Um, please join us for that commemoration, 1 p.m. Will, will, will be our starting time, and, um, and lots of Salvadorans um, will, will be joining us, including this Salvadoran, uh, uh, whose name is Jose Aleman, and we are so glad to have him on the board at Community Church, and he has a statement to read on behalf of Community Church of Boston. Thank you, Jose. The Community Church of Boston is heartbroken by the ongoing genocide in Gaza being executed by Israel with the use of U.S. weapons and U.S. political and financial support. We recognize that this conflict is a manifestation of the occupation and apartheid against the Palestinian people. We call for an end of the U.S. supply of weapons being shipped to Israel. We call on our political leaders to use the leverage to enact an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, along with human humanitarian relief for the Palestinian people of Gaza, living among carnage and in starvation and rubble. We call for a just resolution for the Palestinian people, without which there will be no peace in the Holy Land. The Community Church of Boston is a free community united for the study and practice of universal religion where all are welcome. The Community Church of Boston has been a peace and justice congregation since 1920 that was founded in protest to World War I and in protest of the persecution and unjust execution of Sacco and Vanzetti. We are committed to peace and justice for all, including Palestinians and Israelis. In this spirit, we will continue to support local and international rallies, direct actions, civil disobedience, and more. We will also continue hosting programs about Palestine and Israel in our efforts to educate ourselves and others. Amar, take your word. Great, thank you so much, Jose. So now we are going to get into our Q&A portion, which uh, we'll do until we finish our program tonight. So we're gonna welcome uh, Colonel Wilkerson back to the stage. And I have a cordless mic that I'll walk around with uh, so people can raise their hands if they have questions in the auditorium. And we'll, I'll walk around and um, we'll, we'll, that's how we'll do the Q&A. So. Thanks. Colonel Wilkerson, can you comment on the uh, proposed plan announced by Joe Biden to build a seaport off the coast of Gaza to supposedly allow humanitarian aid to come in? Can you comment on that? Um, it's really, uh, uh, it's kind of like the, those of you who go all the way back to the Cotentin Peninsula and, and the Normandy invasion, it's, it's sort of like the uh, bridge work that we built that actually served as a port until we could get Antwerp. It doesn't have a lot of throughput capacity like a port like Antwerp had, but it does put enough through to, for example, in that case, get Patton's Third Army ready to make its breakout. Um, is it going to put the kind of food into Gaza that is necessary? Not as fast and as efficiently as would happen if 
we were doing it the way we were doing it before, which was, I, I forget the figures, but they're really kind of astronomical when you think about it. It was a thousand trucks a day or something like that going through just the Rafa point. Um, and now it's down to maybe 60 or 70 or 80, uh, which is just not enough to do it. So this will augment that. The drops, the airdrops, were sheer theater, sheer theater. And we even hurt some people with the parachutes landing on them. And you can imagine the frenetic activity that's down there trying to get under that parachute and get to that food first. You can't blame people. They're starving. Um, really cosmetic, though. It didn't, uh, meals ready to eat, it didn't drop enough of them to feed, you know, a, 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 a several families real sustenance that would keep them alive. So it was, it was theater is what it was. The, the pier is a little more than that. Its throughput capacity, if it comes fully up, uh, will be quite a bit of food. I forget what the exact figures are when it's actually working really well and not being messed with by, by anyone. Then you can probably get about, oh, I think it was about a million and a half um, adequate meals in to people through that capacity. The other thing that's happening, you've probably seen in the news, the ship that's coming out of Cyprus, it's getting just about ready to land, I think, and then there's another one behind it and another one behind it. So all of these things together could alleviate somewhat the food problem, but it doesn't alleviate the problem of lead, and it doesn't alleviate the problem of concrete falling on your head and all the rest of the things that are going on. You feed the people so they be fed before they die. Um, that's kind of a you know strange arrangement. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question. I think Charlie had a question. I want to take a moment to say thank you to Dean Stevens and Jose Aleman and Charlie Welsh and the entire Community Church of Boston for putting this event together. So next up is Charlie. A question about the Ukraine. I've been watching a uh, a podcast called The New Atlas. I don't know if you're familiar with it at all. Mm -hmm. It's an ex-serviceman uh, who, um, who is living in Southeast Asia and commenting on things. And he... Um, There's a couple of IDF guys doing that, too. Yeah. <laughs> not not lo beloved of Israel. <laughs> yeah. But um, he, uh, he provides a lot of inter interesting background information on the, uh, on the situation. And he... Uh, one of the statements he's made is that the uh, Russian war industry has been geared up appropriate to supply what they really need. And uh, he, character he contrasted that to the United States war industry, which is uh, mostly interested in gouging profits and not, and, uh, not really geared up to... Uh, Right. providing what's needed. And I was wondering if you have a no, there's take some, on that. There's some truth to that. Um, I'd be careful about how I would uh, use that as a predictor of the future of warfare, though. Because what we are seeing in Ukraine that is, I think, more of a predictor is how the meshing of drones, intelligence, surveillance, ultimately artificial intelligence and the whole network of what, what we call network warfare, warfare, how it's changing the battlefield, completely changing the battlefield. And frankly, we're all behind in that. In many respects, Ukraine is an amalgam of the future, the present, and the past. And you're seeing it all play out on the battlefield and you're seeing a lot of people die principally because they are engaged in that middle sector or that rearward sector while the forward sector is tearing them up. The Russians are taking the most lessons from this. And let me back up a minute and tell you that in 2013 and 2014, the Swiss and the Finns, um, one year, I think 13 was Norwegians too, came to America and gave us at the Center for Naval Analyses some briefings on what the Russians were doing in terms of their core-sized exercises. These are huge exercises. Russia's probably the only country in the world with the terrain to do this sort of thing, and the citizens who will tolerate it. We might have the terrain, but our citizens wouldn't tolerate it. Think of the Louisiana maneuvers right before World War II. 
where George Marshall and his boys proved Patton's theory of armored warfare was a match for the Germans and such. Huge operations. You know, they took up the whole state of Louisiana and part of East Texas. Um, from those exercises, they discovered a couple of really important things. One, the Russians didn't know how to use drones worth a squat. They had no idea how to use drones, especially ISR drones, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance drones, let alone armed drones. They didn't have any armed drones. So guess who stepped in and sent trainers and sold them drones and armed ones? Israel. <laughs> we did too, but the Israelis were the principal ones. The second year, 2014, big improvement. They had learned how to control all these things, to coordinate them, to use them in a core size exercise, which is no, no small problem. Um, so you guys just got to imagine in 15 and 16 and 17 when they did these, they do them every year, they probably got even better and got even better equipment. But what the war did for them, and I was looking at the economic graphs the other day, what the war did for them initially was, you know, kind of give them a, a wake-up call in terms of, well, if you hit a fairly valorous, courageous bunch of people, they can inflict a lot of casualties on you. They never intended to go to Kiev. So, I mean, those old pictures that our press showed about the columns being stopped and turned around and sent back, that was all bull. They never intended to do that. They were just trying to invest those eastern oblasts. So what they've learned now in their industrial base and what they've done in their in their industrial base and in their military doctrine and training and the exercises that they're still doing, you never stop exercising even if you're fighting a war, they have become really good and their economy has really taken off. And if you look at the charts on the economy, you'll see you, there's this one set out there. I, th I can't remember who the source was. It might have been... Uh, might have been the Wall Street Journal, of all things. That's another thing I didn't talk about. Our media is just pitiful. Main, mainstream media is horrible. Propagandists for the administration. And the New York Times works for Israel. The New York Times works for Israel. Read any article and see how many times they sort of take on the Palestinians and how many times they praise the IDF, the Jews, and everything else as they go down the list. It's incredible. But if you look at these charts, what you see is that Prior to about 2014, 2015, the major trade on the top positive side of the graph of Russia is with the United States or with the Western Hemisphere. When you look at it post-2021, 2022, and even more dramatically in 2023, it's flipped over. Almost no trade with North America, and their trade is a reflection of the previous top trade with North America with India and China. So India and China have not only taken and filled the gaps, they've pushed the Russian growth, probably GDP-wise, which is a terrible measure of growth, but I'll use it, to about 2.8, 2.9, maybe even 3%. But what they've really done is revived, helped them revive their industrial base. And North Korea and China in particular or providing things, I wouldn't even be surprised, I don't know this, but I wouldn't be surprised if Israel's defense industry is not still selling them things, because Israel will sell to anybody, anybody, anytime, any place that has the cash or something to give them. Um, and, and we're pretty much that way too, so I shouldn't be complaining about Israel. Um, so you've got a reverse situation economically than anybody thought. I think Joe Biden was convinced by Sullivan and Biden and all the rest of that crew that our sanctions would do. That's another thing. Our, you know we have over 2.6 billion people in the world officially under OFAC, Office of Financial Assets Control and Treasury, sanctioned. Those people hate our guts. It's not good. It's not good policy to go making 2.6 billion people hate your guts. Add another billion who hate our guts because they see us and China and other northern tier countries too is the perpetrators of climate change which is already in the global south affecting them significantly and they didn't put those pollutants up there we did and we're not doing what we should be doing for them that's the way they look at it um, with 35 trillion dollars in aggregate national debt there's good reason why we aren't probably but 
That doesn't excuse it. So we are making enemies of fully a quarter, maybe a third of the world. Every day we are building that enemy list. There's a precept of international relations called conservation of enemies. Simply stated, it says, no prudent state, there's the key word, not insane state, no prudent state ever wants more enemies than it can handle at any one time. Pick them off. We've got a third of the world that hates our guts. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a lot of questions, and we don't have that much time, so I'm just going to request if we could please keep yeah, our I'll questions I'll quit brief. making such long answers. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, yes. I just have a uh, quick question on uh, the United States people, the population. We had 20 years, 23 years of the global war on terror, and the vast majority of people didn't even know what was going on. And then we have Gaza now, and we have Ukraine. And for the mass, vast majority of people, it's off their, their radar screen. Yep. How, how can, how, is there any possible way of waking them up, or is it the economy has to crash first? I think the only way I see is this alternative media that is going so, I mean, it's going bangers now. You've got people who've got half a million listeners, half a million viewers, whatever it might be, or... I mean, look at John Mearsheimer. Look at the hits that he gets now. That tells when John gets 1.5 million hits on his very professorial but correct dissertation on the Russia-Ukraine situation. That's a that's a million and a half people listening to a professor from the University of Chicago tell them the truth. I mean, it, it takes a while to build up this knowledge. But then the question becomes, I think, what your root question is, what the hell do you do about it? I mean, do you, do you fire all the people in Washington and elect new ones? Do you march on Washington? Well, what do you do about it? I think it's going to take some dramatic action if we get through these next four years, and that's a big if, then we, we certainly have got to have put something in motion, something that trains and educates smarter leaders something that trains and educates voters, something that says this is what we need and this is how we need it and this is how we can get it. And it's got to be done by all kinds of organizations like yours, like Vote Vets, like uh, Medea Benjamin's group, Code Pink. Uh, I, I was really proud of her. I, you see her the other day on that tube following that uh, APAC guy down the hallway. I thought she was going to cram the mic in his teeth and I'd have been for that. But... <laughs> You know, she was, would, she's relentless. She wouldn't give up. And I've seen her elsewhere doing things like that. We need more people doing that sort of thing. Well, when we were trying to get the people in London to come out for Julian Assange and to make, make their wishes known, you know, we got a few people out there. But we need hordes of people. We need the kind of people that Dr. King got to come to Washington for his, you know, I have a dream speech. We need that sort of turnout. We need Americans fed up and ready to change, and not MAGA. You know, that's not the answer to it. Please. Taiwan. Taiwan? Chinese do not want to use force against Taiwan. If, if they use force against Taiwan, it will be because we compel them to. Yeah, well, the Speaker of the House is going too, apparently. Um, but they don't want to use force. They do not want to use force. There's too much involved in cross-state strait relations, especially Fujian province in China um, and, and Taiwan's technology base. They're, they're linked. They're really linked. And I know that was an argument used in 1914 to say why, you know, we'd never have a world war. <laughs> we did. Um, but as Barbara Tuckman has said, there was a lot of wooden-headed thinking then. There's not a lot of wooden-headed thinking in Beijing. Been there, done that. I'm one of the few people that ever got to go to this central party school. I know how they think, I think, and I know what they want, and they want to beat us, but they want to beat us Confucian style, uh, Sun Tzu style. They, they want to beat us without having a drop of blood flow. I mean, and they think they can, and they're probably right. And that's what's got us so concerned about them.
because we think they might be right. And we can't stand it. We cannot stand it. The 2002 National Security Strategy put out by George W. Bush, about which I took significant umbrage with my boss when he said, well, it's just the same old pablum. I said, it is not. What that strategy says is that we are on top of the mountain, thank you very much, and we're looking down the slopes of that mountain. And if we see even a mouse begin to climb that slope, if we see the leaves rustling at the bottom of that slope, we're going to bash them with bombs, bullets, and sanctions. That's what that strategy says. We're king, and everybody better recognize it. Well, I can tell you something. China and India and Iran aren't going to recognize it ever. And there's 90 million people in Iran. There's 1.4 billion in China. And very soon, India will beat China. That's a lot of people. That's a third of the world. You can't do this. You cannot do this. You cannot be hegemon of the world and expect that the rest of the world won't move to balance you and eliminate you. Ask Persia. Ask Rome, Eastern or Western. Ask the Ottomans. Ask the Habsburgs. Ask the Wehrmacht and the Third Reich. Ask the Soviet Union. I used to ask my students, where is it engraved in granite anywhere? Please take me there and show me that the American empire is eternal. No empire in the history of man, the 5,000 years we know most about, has survived. Why would anyone think we will? Thank you. Okay. Next up, Dean. Um, Larry, before we started, you were telling us something that really fascinated me, that you participate in some kind of uh, forum that you call right. IPC, which right. is a uh, an envisioning of uh, a yeah. Palestinian-Israeli federation that will in the future govern the, the, the region, and it fascinated me, and, and I, I wonder if you'd talk about that. It's just a, a glimmer of, of hope and of, of, of vision. It's fascinating simulation every other Sunday. You can all join it. If, uh, if you'll give me a, a blanket email or whatever, you know, I'll send it to you. I anyone can sign up for it. Since the Gaza War started, we have gone from about 78 or so every, Sunday, every other Sunday to over 200. Um, we have Knesset members. We have f former Knesset members. We have Palestinian Authority. We have Hamas we have uh, all manner of other citizens interested. Most of them are either Palestinian or Jewish. Not all of them. Some are like me. Um, and what we do is we simulate the Israel-Palestine Confederation. We hold an Internet election. We let 14 million people between the river and the sea who are registered voters vote. They elect, we simulate, they elect. 300 legislatures, half Palestinian, half Israeli Jews. Those 300 people then legislate above the two existing governments. It used to be three with Hamas. Now we just have the two, Palestinian Authority and Israel. Both those states, sovereign states, have veto power over anything we pass that they are indispensable to the execution of. Anything else... It just goes because we have legitimacy. We had five and a half million people vote for us out of 14 million. It's fascinating what we've been able to get passed. We've been able to get uh, a joint task force through that takes over guarding the checkpoints so that Palestinians can come and go to work without being harassed. We have... Uh, Pass laws that say you have to teach tolerance in the schools, and we develop the curriculum for that tolerance teaching. You have to teach all the different languages in the schools, and we develop the curriculum. And uh, It's amazing what we've been able to do, but boy, do we have some arguments. Holy mackerel. Sometimes Joseph, Joseph Avazar, Los Angeles attorney, a Jew himself, um, who is just an exceptional guy, he sort of orchestrates it, and he'll say, okay, you're done. Leave. Go. 
I'm going to mute you right now. <laughs> you have to do that sometimes because they won't, just won't shut up. But generally speaking, it is a very good eyesight or telescope into what's going on in the world and how many people would really pitch in and do what needs to be done if they were given a process to do it. And they say we can't have this election. Well, au contraire. Joseph conducted an election back in 2006 online, had over 100,000 people participate, and he had no money but his own personal money. We're saying that we could get at least 5 to 6 million people to participate in an online election if we had $100 million. One day of the Gaza war cost $100 million. If we had one day of the Gaza war, we could conduct this election. And we think the legitimacy bestowed by that many people voting on this IPC government would give it a lot of oomph. And we're seeing it in the simulation. And as I said, you can participate too. It's fascinating just from the, what you see go on with the different people arguing. I'm thinking maybe we can have uh, a church service. It's, it's right during, uh, like Sunday morning at 11 or 12. It, it's, uh, for me, Eastern Standard Time, uh, Daylight Savings Now, it's noon. It's all over the world different for all these people. That's who a fascinating idea. I think we had we'll a guy from Nazareth someday. last time. You know, Nazareth is a funny place. Uh, not funny. It's a strange place. Nazareth is about 79,000 or so, and about, oh, somewhere between half and two-thirds are not Jewish. They're either Palestinian Arab or they're Christians. Lots of Christians, Nazareth. Lots of Christians there. So I usually elect to play the representative from Nazareth so I can mix and mingle all the things that I say in the simulation. But it's fun, too. Um, but it's very, very insightful with a C and an S. <laughs> what was Colin Powell like? What was it like to work for him or to work with him? What did he believe in? What did he stand for? What are some lessons we could learn from Colin Powell? Well, he was a genuine human being to start with, one of the few general officers I ever met in my 31 years in the military who would look at you and say, don't stop talking because I don't agree. Please, I want your I want your views and I want your opinion more powerfully and more strongly when you disagree than when you agree. I can find a thousand people to agree with me. I want somebody to tell me I'm wrong and then prove it to me or try to prove it to me. And he was a very kind man, very gentle man. Um, he was, if anything, terribly naive. He approached the world like this. Hello, I'm happy to meet you. Until you prove otherwise, and you have to do it dramatically, I'm going to assume you're as good a man as I am. And he got fooled lots of times, lots of times. Okay, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Next question. Yeah, Colonel, uh, when Colin Powell went to UN and he said Iraq has weapons of mass dis destruction, did he know it's not true? No. I was there with him almost every minute of every day. I lived at the CIA. Um, I'll give you one dramatic example of how he was treated. It was the third day. We were there seven days and seven nights. It was the third day, late afternoon. He had never physically accosted me in the 16 years I'd been with him to that point. He grabbed me by the lapel like this, drug me into a room off the corridor of the National Intelligence Council, sat me down in a chair, slammed the door shut, and said, we're alone in here, right? I said, well, it is the CIA, boss. <laughs> he, did, he wasn't amused. Um, so I sat down. He said, I want all of this stuff about Saddam Hussein's connections with Al-Qaeda taken out of the presentation, every bit of it. It's all junk. I think he thought I was going to object. I said, I don't object. I think you're right. Oh, got a smile on his face, turned around and walked out. I went over to Lynn Davidson, who was sitting at the computer. She was putting the thing together. 
And I said, Lynn, I know you've been hard working and everything else, but you've got to go through it, and I'll help you. We're going to extract everything in there that says Saddam Hussein had contacts with al-Qaeda. Leaning against the door jam was John McLaughlin, the deputy director of Central Intelligence, the deputy director of the CIA, the only really professional intel guy, whole life, 30 years in intelligence, in the group. George Tenet was a politician. He disappears. Stupid me. I should have immediately smelled a snake, you know, a rat. We go back and we resume the sort of rudimentary rehearsal that Powell was doing at that time in the DCI conference room. And George gets up and leaves. Well, I'm a rate. I'm, I, I'm sitting beside Powell, and I told George, you don't leave when the Secretary of State is here. And he leaves. Fifteen minutes he's gone. So I'm about to jump up and go fetch him, and all of a sudden he comes back in, and he sits down beside Powell, and in a stage whisper, which I could clearly hear, and I will never forget these words, he said, we have just learned from the interrogation of a high-level al-Qaeda operative of significant contacts between the Mukhobarat, the secret police of Saddam Hussein, and al-Qaeda to include training them in the use of biological and chemical weapons. Powell looked at me and said, LW, put it all back in. Story continues. I'm up in the Waldorf Astoria, 2 a.m. in the morning before the 9 o'clock presentation on the Security Council floor. And I'm doing what Powell told me to do six hours prior when we rehearsed in the cafeteria at the top of the UN-U.S. mission, U.S.-U.N. mission in New York. And he said, it's too long, cut some stuff. And I said, Tara, right? He said, yep. So I'm in, the, I'm in the hotel room, and I'm cutting stuff out. And Phil Mudd walks in the room. He wasn't even staying in the same hotel. What are you doing here, Phil? I'm over here because I heard you were cutting things out of the presentation, and you're cutting my part. He was tenant's terrorism czar. I said, you're damn right I am. The boss told me to. Get out of here. So the next morning, I knew Phil would rat me out. The next morning, 8.30, right before the presentation at the Security Council, Tenet walks up to me, puts his arm around me. He says, I hear you were cutting things out of the presentation last night. I said, damn straight I was. What did you cut out? A bunch of terror stuff. You didn't cut the stuff about Saddam and al-Qaeda, did you? No, because that was the most powerful thing with the American people. No question about it. All the polls showed that afterwards. Okay, no problem then. He went up there and sat down. So he was at the last minute trying to get it back in, what Phil had, you know. But it, we, we didn't take the most important thing out. Later, Tennant has to fess up. I don't think Tennant was lying. I think John McLaughlin was lying to Tennant. He fessed up to Colin Powell in August, well after the February presentation, and he said, that was Sheikh al-Libby. He was tortured in Cairo by some of the worst torturers in the world, and he recanted the moment the torture ended, and the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, put a burn notice out on his testimony. Well, the first thing I did when I found out about that from the secretary was I called John, and I said, why didn't you tell us about the burn notice? He said, well, it was a computer glitch. Yeah, right. Thank you. Those were not happy days. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. G g given that uh, uh, Biden can't stand to have Russia win before the election, and, and it does look as though Russia is driving the Ukrainians back throughout the whole battlefield. What, are you worried about the lengths the United States will go to to keep Russia from winning between now and then? I don't think we can, but here's what I'm worried about. Um, let's say Putin listens to his military and his military says, you know, we really would love to have Odessa. Odessa is a far better port than any other one they have, including Sevastopol. Um, keep going. What's to stop him? 
and you can get over there and link up with Moldova. Um, and then what have you got if you're Kiev? You have no port now at all. So that's what I'm more worried about. Um, there's no way. If, if NATO came together and said, we're going to stop you, Russia, we'd all get nuked. And I'm not so sure that if we kept it conventional and the American people got confronted with 10,000 casualties a day, which they haven't been confronted with in their lives, that we wouldn't be the one to first use a nuke. And that concerns me. I go back to 1945. Harry had no problem with that second bomb. No problem. He made the decision just like that. And even more so than that, if you want an indicator, when he was briefed on going from the standard nuclear weapon, as it were, to the new thermonuclear, which was just a order of magnitude increase of destruction, took him about two seconds to make the decision. Can you comment for us about uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon and Ansar Allah, the Houthis in Yemen? Sure. I'm really worried about Netanyahu if he really gets feeling desperate, and I think he's right there right now because I'm hearing very much that they're going to throw him out. And if they throw him out, he's probably going to jail, that he will try in desperation to expand the war. And he's got military leaders that he can talk to that could expand it very quickly by really taking on Hezbollah. And he wants to. He wants to take on Hezbollah. He'd prefer to have us do it. But the best way to get us to do it is to get himself in an extremist situation with them and have to call us in in order to do it. And then the second part of it was Yemen. They're just doing what I'd be doing if I were they and I saw the Palestinians being treated the way they are. Um, I don't think they'd be doing it if Gaza weren't going on. Um, and they've become very effective at what they're doing, partly with Iranian help, but I'm convinced they're getting help from elsewhere now, possibly possibly even counterintuitively, possibly even China, and certainly probably Russia, because China's got just as much to risk in the sea, Red Sea. The Red Sea is the new cockpit of strategic competition. Persian Gulf, bleh, Persian Gulf, what's it got? Gas and oil. Yeah, both of them are going away eventually. Well, it's still important, but the Red Sea, if you look at the commerce that flows through the Red Sea, it's significant. I mean, for China, it's very important. It's something like 40% of their shipping goes up through there. That's why they're, they're now, what are the Israelis doing right now? You don't see the media in this country picking up on it at all. They're building an alternative to the Suez Canal. In fact, this Gaza conflict may have expedited this process somewhat because now they're not going to have to worry about dispossessing Gazans of land. They're building an alternative to the Suez Canal. They're also building an entrepot down there at the bottom. What has Erdogan done? In addition to buying Alexandria, Egypt, and its port facilities, apparently, because El Sisi needed money so badly, they have bought a cheek and jowl stretch of the Sinai beside what Israel's doing. Erdogan's no fool. Erdogan wants to be there, and he wants to be able to control it if he has to. He's also back in Libya again, now that the turmoil has gotten out of hand, and it looks like he can find some ground to find a space. And as I said before, he's in Somalia. He bought a piece of land in Somalia so he can be on the Red Sea. Erdogan's a smart man. Here's what he could have done. Think about this for a minute. I mean, we're not in this age anymore, thank God. Erdogan could have marched his army down that narrow strip of land that encompasses only Lebanese and Syrian territory, picking up volunteers all the way, confronted the IDF, and destroyed it. That's how good an army Turkey has. What would he have done? He would have fulfilled his lifelong dream to be the unifier of the Muslim world, to be that man who brought the Islamic empire back into being, not as a caliphate, not as ISIS created, but as the leader of the Islamic world from Ankara. Imagine, Shia, Sunni, wouldn't have mattered. Kurd, 
they would all rally to his cause, at least for a moment or two. And he would have the entire Muslim world with him. And he would have taken out the Nakba people. But he won't do that, I, th I don't think. I hope not, because it would be bloody. And guess who would probably get involved? Okay, I think we are going to give the last question of the night to our board member, Alan Perez. Alan. Uh, thank you. What do you think about this narrative, that the problem is Netanyahu and not Israel? I keep hoping that that might be a significant element and that we will see it come to bear if he's kicked out, which I think he is very much close to being kicked out. But my friends in Israel, and I do have some very good friends in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem and in Hebron and other places like that, tell me, Larry, don't be an idiot. 85% of the people in Israel who are Jewish feel the same way Bibi does. They might not like Bibi, but they feel the same way he feels. I find that hard to believe. But they're there, and I'm not. And all of all of these interlocutors, these sources I have, are Jewish. One of them's even a member of the IDF. Thank you, Alan, for that question. Thank you, Colonel Wilkerson. One more question. One more question from. Can Susan. I can I just add one thing? Sure. Do you know Daniel Levy at all? Daniel will tell you this. If, if he'll be truthful with you, because sometimes Daniel doesn't like saying it either. You know, he was a negotiator for previous uh, Israeli prime ministers. But he will tell you that he's been all through the uh, West Bank. He's been all through the state of Israel. He's been all through the uh, uh, portions of parts of Jerusalem. And he says it's astonishing how many want to eradicate the Palestinians. Thank you. Next question from Susan. Thank you for your presentation. Here in Boston, we have been moved by the BDS movement. And we are more and more aware of all the companies, Israeli companies in Good the United you. States. But uh, at a personal level, what, does it tickle Washington? Or is it going to be a BDS movement that is country to country? that can generate any changes or people's movement towards the companies that have been allies to Israel or to people, activists that say out of Boston, out of Washington, out of the United States are going to make any changes at all. Does it make a difference with the uh, politics about um, how much Israel um, Wiggles, the dog, um, as the United States. Uh, what is with the BGS movement, in your opinion? I think the greatest evidence you're going to see of a positive or negative answer or middle-of-the-road answer to your question is when you get companies like Amazon in particular. I saw they're on the list now. They are on the list of companies that do extensive work for Israel and with Israel. In fact, I tried to follow the BDS list myself, and I saw Amazon, and I thought, oh, God, can I do that? Because I order things all the time. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do it. I'm going to try to stop doing all business with Amazon. I just canceled my Amazon Prime account, my TV account. Um, but when those business leaders, pocketbooks, are impacted, they will bring pressure on Washington that you'll see the results of. But until that happens, I don't think it is. So that means you've got to get a lot of people, a lot of Americans have to agree that this is worth doing, and they have to do it. Hewlett Packard is also on that list now. Um, in fact, some of the companies on there, I, I had to go back and make sure my research was straight. So I called a couple of people like um, uh, Medea Benjamin and 
some others and said, is this right, this new list that I'm looking at here? And they all said yes. Amazon's really going to hurt my heart. <laughs> I mean, I order something from Amazon about every three days. I order my fly, the fish, the fly fishing uh, things that I use. Amazon's got everything. You know where my flies came from? I ordered flies for fishing in northern Idaho. They're called renegades. They're little dry flies they fish for trout with. They came from Vlicken, Germany in a little package. Amazon's fingers touch everything in the world now. These guys in Flicken, Germany are making these flies, these trout flies, for somebody fishing in the United States and Idaho. So get, getting people to boycott Amazon going to be tough. But, but, imagine if you could really impact their bottom line something would happen. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Colonel Wilkerson. Sure.